Stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Isabel Webster. Thanks for joining us on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's 9pm, this is Patrick Christie's tonight with me, Ben Leo. Another Tory slee scandal, this time concerning Mark Menzies. He denies any wrongdoing, but just why are so many of our right honourable members actually right wrong -uns? And... Going to die, definitely they want to kill him. What happens when do-good and plain passengers stop asylum seeker deportations? Well, let me tell you, one of them went on to rape a British teenager. Very well done. Meanwhile... I think it is completely unforgivable in the face of complete climate catastrophe. As the SNP drops its deranged net zero targets, is Hamza Youssef Britain's biggest hypocrite? Meanwhile, breaking tonight, Nicola Sturgeon's husband has been charged in connection with the police investigation into the SNP's finances. And whilst we're at it, why does the SNP want to ask four-year-olds, yes, four-year-olds, if they're gay, bi or trans? Plus... Uh, uh, uh. No, 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 no. It was all kicking off today. Chaos in the Commons amid the excess death scandal. And did Angela Rayner pay up to £23,000 for this kitchen? As ever, I've got tomorrow's newspaper front pages and a top panel to boot. Tonight, I'm joined by Star Daily Telegraph columnist, columnist Alan, Alison Pearson, ex-Labour advisor Matthew Laza, and, of course, GB News presenter and superstar Nana Aquir. Strap yourselves in. Let's do this. Has your MP got a sleazy, dirty secret? Next. Ben, thank you. And the top story from the GB Newsroom tonight is that it's understood Nicola Sturgeon's husband, Peter Murrell, has been charged in connection with embezzlement of funds from the Scottish National Party following an investigation into the party's finances. The former SNP chief executive was re-arrested this morning at around 9 o'clock, we believe, with Police Scotland now saying he is no longer in police custody after he was questioned by detectives. He'd previously been arrested and released without charge last April. Now, as you've been hearing, the Scottish Government has scrapped its interim target aimed at reducing the country's carbon emissions by 75% by 2030. The Minister for Net Zero in Scotland said the original target was unattainable, so a revised package of measures will deliver Scotland's transition to net zero at a pace and scale that is feasible. Greenpeace said this afternoon on Twitter, now called X, the Scottish Government's decision to scrap their climate targets is embarrassing and infuriating. Well, the First Minister, Humza Yousaf, told the Scottish Parliament the overall net zero goal, the one by 2045, won't be budging. The Climate Change Committee were always clear with us that the 2030 target was a stretch target. That was clear to all of us when we all committed, when we all backed that target in the first place. But what doesn't change and what won't change is that end de destination of 2045. Yousaf. Now in other news today, Andrew Malkinson, who 20 years ago was wrongly jailed for rape, has rejected the Criminal Cases Review Commission's unreserved apology, saying it's too little, too late. 57-year-old Andrew Malkinson was found guilty of raping a woman in Manchester in 2003 and a year later he was jailed for life. He could have been released after six years if he'd given a false confession, something he was never prepared to do, always instead protesting his innocence. His conviction was overturned after fresh DNA evidence linked the crime to another man. Mr Malkinson had applied for his case to be referred to the Court of Appeal but had been rejected twice. 
The Lord Chancellor has called his case today an atrocious miscarriage of justice. A man's been sentenced to four years in prison for hoax terrorism, targeting primary schools, airports, hotels and shopping centres. In 2013, Gary Preston sent 42 envelopes containing white powder and threatening letters, which caused panic and evacuations at various locations nationwide over a six-week period. The envelopes actually contained talcum powder and the threatening letters were written in Arabic text. One envelope led to the evacuation of a 300-room hotel. The 64-year-old was arrested after more than 10 years on the run, pleading guilty to 21 charges. And just lastly, the Prince of Wales has returned to public duties today for the first time since his wife's announcement that she's been treated for cancer. William's been meeting volunteers at a food distribution centre in Surrey, as well as lending a hand in the charity's kitchen. He was also presented with very many Get Well Soon cards for Kate. The Prince's last official engagement was over a month ago. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GP News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gpnews.com slash alerts. It's time we had a conversation about Parliament, specifically the types of people we are electing to represent us. MPs call themselves right honourables, but some of the behaviour displayed by Commons cohorts in recent years makes me think they should be called right wrong uns instead. Just a fortnight ago, Conservative MP William Ragg played the victim when it was revealed. He not only shared explicit pictures of himself on a gay dating app with an unknown person he'd never met, leaving himself open for blackmail, by the way, but he then tried to worm his way out of the foolish predicament by handing over the phone numbers of dozens of other MPs and parliamentary staffers so they too could be snared in a honey trap sexting plot. He never, uh, sorry, he did apologise, of course. He told the Times newspaper, I'm so sorry my weakness has caused other people hurt. Well, isn't that noble? But in 2022, Tory MP Chris Pincher, the man who broke the camel's back when it came to Boris Johnson's resignation, lived up to his name when he was found to have drunkenly groped two men at a posh private members club in London. Other allegations also surfaced from separate incidents. Last year, the then Conservative MP Peter Bone was found by an independent regulator to have repeatedly hit and verbally abused a member of his staff, often asking him for massages and on one occasion putting his bare genitals in the other man's face. Bone insists the allegations never took place and, of course, that he says they're false and untrue. But who can forget this weasel as well? Matt Hancock, the Covid-era health secretary here, proving an honest and trustworthy individual by cheating on his wife, betraying his family and also the public in the process, in the offices, don't forget, of the Department for Health. It's not all Tory MPs, by the way. Who can forget Keith Teflon Vaz, the married father of two Labour MPs, suspended from Parliament in 2019 after offering to buy cocaine for rent boys. If you don't remember, he tried to disguise his real identity by saying he was a washing machine salesman called Jim. Fast forward to today then, where Tory MP Mark Menzies is under investigation for allegedly using thousands of pounds from party donors to pay for private expenses. According to The Times, the government trade envoy rang an elderly local party volunteer at 3.15 in the morning in December saying he was locked out of his flat by bad people and he needed £5,000 as a matter of life or death. The sum mysteriously rose to six and a half grand later on and was actually paid by his office manager from local party coffers. The paper reports a further £14,000 given by donors for use on the Tory campaign trail had previously been transferred to Menzies' personal bank account and used for his private medical expenses. The Conservative Party has been aware of the allegations of potential fraud for more than three months, yet took no action until today when they suspended him. In a statement to The Times, Mr Menzies said, I strongly dispute the allegations put to me. I have fully complied with all the rules for declarations. As there is an ongoing investigation, I will not be commenting further. But look, it's not Menzies' first rodeo, is it? In 2014, he was at the centre of a sex for money scandal. Rogério Santos, 19, a Brazilian rent boy, told the Sunday Mirror that the MP had paid him for sex and asked him to buy drugs. He denied the claims but resigned as a ministerial aide regardless. And three years later, Menzi was interviewed by cops over, frankly, a quite bizarre accusation that he deliberately got a friend's dog drunk. That's right, a dog. 
The pooch needed emergency treatment at the vets for alcohol poisoning. Our parliamentarians are meant to be the best of society. The reality is most of them can only be described as low grade, and that's quite frankly being generous. If they're not carrying a whole load of sexual baggage around, they're typically so incompetent that rarely would they ever get a job at a top FTSE 100 company or, let's be honest, survive two minutes in the real world with real people taking on real challenges. Is this the best we can really do? And has the Conservative Party, in particular, got a sleaze problem that urgently needs addressing? I'm joined now by former Tory MP Neil Parrish, who actually himself resigned as an MP in 2022 after watching porn on his phone in the Commons. Good evening, Neil. Thank you for joining me. So, look, let's just clear up your situation first of all. Can you just remind viewers about your self-described moment of madness in the Commons that led to your resignation? Then we can speak about Menzies and the Tories on a wider scale, if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I looked twice at porn on my phone. Uh, the first time I went into the site accidentally, but the second time I went in on purpose, and that's why I resigned from the House of Commons, because the behaviour was bad. I mean, it, my behaviour was very bad in as much that it was very bad to myself. I did not intend to do anybody else any offence, but it was wrong what I was doing. Um, and I think that's the distinction I would make, but I don't justify my actions, and that's why I resigned so quickly. Got it. And just, just sorry, last question on this matter. Why were you watching Port? Were you bored in the Commons? What was, what was going through your head? Yeah, I mean, I think some people think, you know, it was in the middle of debate or in the middle of question time. It was 11.30 at night uh, and we had a 12 votes and we were waiting. I was right in the corner of the chamber. It's probably an argument as to whether I was actually in the chamber or not. Um, but, you know, uh, I did and, and I watched it and, and I resigned. So okay. that was... Yeah. Oh, look, Neil, thanks for clearing that up. I uh, appreciate your honesty. On the, the wider topic of, I mean, today, Mark Menzies, but is there a sleaze problem in the Conservative Party? Why does it seem like so many politicians, I'll mention some Labour ones there as well, Keith Vaz, there are others, but particularly the Conservatives in recent weeks, is there a sleaze problem with the Tories? Well, certainly there seems to be a sort of run of things at the moment. And I think um, you quite rightly say that at the end of the day, the population, you know, they put us in Parliament uh, to pass laws. Um, you know, I was a chair of a select committee, Environment, Food, Rural Affairs. Uh, you took that job seriously. And so you, they expect you to behave uh, well. And I think, you know, this is the problem at the moment. There seems to be a number of MPs uh, that haven't. And, and um, you see, the problem with with Mark, in a way, is and we have to wait to see what all that comes out. But you know, you can't use party donors' money uh, for your own expenses. That's an absolute no-no. Um, and the whole thing seems bizarre. And I think really we need to know a lot more about it to find out exactly what happened. But again, it does bring parliamentarians into disrepute. That's the problem. OK, well, look, of course, Mark denies those allegations, but as you mentioned, his, his previous rap sheet, I mean, I read it this morning, and it is something akin to a movie script. Uh, and, of course, you had William Ragg in recent weeks. I mean, the fact that he was happy to send explicit pictures uh, to a complete random he'd never met on a gay dating app, I mean, that's bad enough, let alone dragging his colleagues into it. But, Neil Parrish, thank you for joining us. And, again, I appreciate you talking about your own situation. But let's get the thoughts now of tonight's top panel, Daily Telegraph columnist... Alison Pearson, former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza, and GB News superstar presenter Nana Aquir. Alison, let's start with you. Am I being a bit harsh here? Is there a, a sleaze problem? And why are there so many apparently sexual deviants in Parliament? I don't think you could be too harsh, Ben, quite honestly. This is one of the... We've been all been laughing about this. is one of the most bizarre... I thoughts. heard you giggling during my, uh, my <laughs> monologue. What, what tickled you? Um... Just the story about this um, Mark Menzies wandering around from flat to flat, ringing up elderly members of the Conservative Party to ask <laughs> if, if they can bung him five grand because he's mixing with bad men, as he said. I mean, oh, the whole thing is farcical. Um, I actually think it may be time to give the Brazilian rent boys a go as members of the Tory party because they couldn't do worse <laughs> than the existing members. Look, it's a combination. Ben, you are too young. Nana may be too young. I think Matthew and I are just about no. old. Enough. The, end of, the end of the John Major, 18 years 
years of Conservative government, it all ends in farce. It ended in every week in 1997 before Blair's landslide. We had some shame-faced husband at the front gate of the house with the Thank wife you. and kids, you know, the David Mellor wearing a mm. Chelsea strip and <laughs> sucking the toes of Antonia de Sancho. Oh. Have I got yeah. that no, right? That's right, yeah. But basically, <laughs> it's, it's, the end of, it's the end of days now. It's ending in farce, this Tory government. I mean, it, you know, it's been 14 in the last however many years, hasn't it? I mean, I, do, I just want to... I'd be interested to see what everyone thinks. Is it that narcissistic, reckless people are drawn towards politics? Because it seems to me what these men are doing yeah. is madness. It's personal madness, isn't it? Matthew Larson, is there a case that MPs pay... I mean, it went up to something like, was it, £93,000 mm. in recent weeks, of course, <laughs> yeah. uh, approved by an independent body, yeah. so they didn't mark their own homework. But is there a case to maybe increase it to 150 k a year, maybe even double it to kind of get a better quality of person? Well, I think, I, I, I think that's going to be a big issue because Labour's uh, insisting on its ban on second jobs, which is going to be a big issue uh, if there's a Labour government. It seemed to have gone quiet for a while, but it's come back now, and so there'll be a few exceptions for people like doctors um, uh, to, be able to be able to do some work, but it's a sort of going to hit those who have a, have big sidelines, like uh, Jeffrey Cox, the former Attorney General, who makes hundreds of thousands as a very successful lawyer. But I don't think that's going to affect the, um, uh, the, the sort of what you might call the moral compass. Look, mm -hmm. most politicians go into politics to make the world a better place, whether they've got a red rosette, a blue rosette, or a different colour rosette on. They do it for the best of reasons. But it's a funny old life, uh, and I think that's it, it, it's a funny existence. You're 200 miles away from your family if you have one. Uh, you know, most people don't sort of start work in the afternoon and go to 10 o'clock in terms of where they have to be. But, you know, so I think what it does is it just attracts people who are certain risk takers. And, and I think, you know, you're going to put yourself under a lot of scrutiny. You've got to sort of be out there on a Friday afternoon talking to people about their problems, but also you've got to be pointing at potholes um, and, uh, you know, opening the local faith. I mean, so it's... I think what it does is people who are slightly sort of self obsessed um, uh, go into politics because you have to be to do it. I but mean, it's... It's, it's and that doesn't mean that you have to end up bringing your 78-year-old um, uh, campaigner, uh, former campaigner, well, to get five grand in the middle of the night, going, which is the scandal to them all. You're describing it as a strange old life. I mean, allegedly doing that, roaming the streets at 3 a.m., asking your uh, elderly party manager for thousands of pounds. I think he's bizarre, a one-off. I've never heard anything as bizarre as this before. Nana, no, um, no, you were shaking I, I, your head at the sorry. suggestion <clears> about <throat> increasing no, the... I'm trying to defend the old No, no, they shouldn't get more money. Hang on, no, let me just tell you. My, my point is, the yeah. quality of politicians we mm. have, not, if they're not involved in sleaze or scandal, they're just so incompetent. Well, well, listen, first of all, I don't think they should get any more money. I think 93000 is that what it is now? Is, uh, is Most people listening to that will think that's a good salary. I also don't think they should have a second job because they're not even doing the first one properly. I mean, look at them. Where are these people actually doing any work? Every time they're either shifting from one position to another or they're doing something sleazy. I mean, and, and it's not just Conservatives. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Because there's been 18 now independent uh, MPs and eight of them are Conservative. 14 of which are Tories, Seven, I think. No, no, eight of them Conservative. Seven of them are Labour. And there's one DUP, one SNP, and there's one Cloud Cymru. So there's a mix of people. There's, there's actually all... more independent now than there are Lib Dems. Exactly. Yes, so, exactly. <laughs> so, They'll so, be getting their own time. So look, I, actually <laughs> think, I actually think they should be paid less. I think they should be maybe paid on, the no, 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 average no, no. wage. Let, let me finish. Let me pick you up on that. George Freeman, the, the Conservative member for Bid Norfolk, he said he, he quit as a minister for science, innovation and technology last year because he said he couldn't afford his rising mortgage payments. He's well, on, what, well, well, five grand? Well, now? is he a Conservative? Yes. I mean, he's part of the party and part of the problem as to why the mortgage rates are up, isn't he? Exactly. So, frankly, the fact that he's whimpering and seeing what the rest of us are having to deal with, that's life. He should move into a cheaper accommodation because that's what we'd all have to do. Instead of going, oh, I want more money, I want a second job. Do your first one properly. I think it should be a vocation. You know, the, the nurses and everything, they're paid a, a fraction of this. So how about our politicians get paid less? It becomes a vocational job. Rishi Sunak's literally doing it as a vocation because he doesn't need the money. And I, it would arguably, I would say, that we're better off with people who, don't, who are doing it not for the money but for the passion of it. And that's where you but get Alison, the why are CCHQ, and we're talking about the Tories here particularly, yeah. why are CCHQ selecting this calibre of person? Because it's, it, there seems to be a theme developing here, doesn't it? I think they're looking for people they can manage. So we did a Telegraph did a piece recently that they were actually turning down people who showed any signs of conservatism, you know, because they don't want that, obviously, because that's going to upset the apple cart. So they're choosing malleable people. Often it's, you know, a minister's sort of step niece or something. There's an awful lot of corruption, Ben, you'll be startled to hear. <laughs> uh, so I think that... Um, they are not choosing. They are not choosing the best caliber people. I disagree with Nana. I would 
I would double the pay, no. and I would, but I would get people who had proven experience, mm -hmm. who were, anything. you know, yeah. over 50 or something like that, and actually just say, have some life. Yeah, on, yeah. there's yeah. something yeah. in the air. That's one of the there's issues with in Rand. the air in Westminster. They get there, their head explodes, and suddenly they think, hey, I'm here, mm -hmm. and something weird happens to them when they're well, in. Yeah. I think I don't know what's. I mean, Neil's here. interesting because there's a lot of hanging. Politics is a bit like making a movie. There's a lot of hanging around. You know, he was waiting for votes, <laughs> um, and, I mean, there, I, and I, there's I, also a lot of drinking going on. Yeah, absolutely. Honestly, I appreciate his honesty. I mean, Absolutely. the top man. But there's also too much drinking that goes on as well. Paul on the comments benches. Anyway, great stuff. Thank you. Mm. Plenty more uh, from you guys in the show. Alison Pearson, Matthew Laza, Nana Okria, thank you so much. Um, now, uh, change of gear. There's still plenty of time to grab your chance to win a Greek cruise, travel goodies, and £10,000 tax free cash. Uh, Patrick, of course, has gone away on his own holiday, hence why I'm here. Here's all the details you need to try and grab your own. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Very good luck to you. I love a cruise. I've done about eight or nine of them. Are you uh, cruise fans, you guys? No? No one. Always want to Take it up. Go. Very good fun. Still to come, major developments concerning the royal family. Prince William appeared in public today for the first time since the Princess of Wales cancer announcement. But don't expect the hard times to cause a reunion because Prince Harry, he's officially changed his primary country of residence to the United States. Mail on Sunday's editor-at-large, Charlotte Griffiths, joins me live in the studio, and she comes with a bombshell piece of information on the King's health struggles. You don't want to miss it. But up next, as Scottish primary schools appoint children as LGBT champions, is it wrong for pupils as young as four to be asked if they're gay, lesbian or trans? Trans school teacher Debbie Hayton goes head-to-head -head with human rights activist Peter Tatchell next. This is Patrick Christie tonight with G on Indian GB News with me, Ben Leo. Stick with us. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Amazing. Extraordinary. And also, she was unflappable, apparently, yeah. the Princess Royal. She's just brilliant. refused to get out of the car and said, I'm not going anywhere. Extraordinary. Well, Jim Beaton was awarded the George Cross for protecting the Princess and delighted to say, joins us now, along with the former head of Royal Royalty Protection, Di Davis. Jim, you won't remember, but I met you some time ago at the Imperial War Museum when Princess Anne was opening an exhibition to do with the George Cross and you were there reunited with her, um, and you told me then what great admiration you had for the princess, cool under fire, but you didn't do so badly yourself. It was probably my job, and also um, I had a wee bit of police training, not very much, but a little bit, uh, whereas uh, Princess Anne had nothing, and yet the way she displayed it, you would have thought she'd been uh, highly trained to... Um, deal with any type of that situation. Even though you'd had some training, you took three bullets for the princess. You effectively stood between her and a deranged gunman. Well, I was supposed to be a protection officer, really, so um, I just tried to fuddle about. You must remember that back in 1974, there was no communication, and we were extremely lucky that Michael Hill's who was outside Clarence House and nearby, had got one of the fast police radios, um, or radios on his shoulder, so he was able to send a message out. Otherwise, we would have just been relying on the good old public to phone in and say there was something happening. Yeah, so times have changed drastically.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. This is Patrick Christie tonight with me, Ben Leo, only on GB News. Coming up, does the Duke of Sussex, Prince Harry, need to lay off his dad? But first, is it wrong for kids as young as four, four years old, to be asked if they're gay, lesbian or trans? Time now for the head-to-head. -head. And astonishing new documents have revealed that Scottish primary schools are signing up to a shocking scheme that encourages them to appoint pupils as, quote, LGBT champions, asking kids as young as four if they're gay, lesbian or trans. The scheme is the brainchild of the taxpayer-funded charity LGBT Youth Scotland, which charges schools up to two grand a pop for membership of its LGBT Charter for Education. So each school that joins must appoint at least two children as so-called LGBT champions, with schools also encouraged to ask pupils if they're gay, lesbian or trans. And to make matters even worse, the schools are also asked to provide evidence of so-called LGBT safe spaces, such as gender-neutral toilets. It comes as Scotland's only gender clinic. Today, paused the prescription of puberty blockers after the CAS report concluded that vulnerable kids had been given the harmful drugs based on, quote, weak evidence. So that long overdue decision brings Scotland into line with England, where puberty blockers have, of course, been banned since March this year. And only after Scottish First Minister Hamza Youssef dragged his heels on the issue, leaving it up to the clinicians to decide what to do. So, as Scottish primary schools appoint kids as LGBT champions, is it wrong for pupils as young as four to be asked if they're gay, lesbian or trans? Let me know your thoughts by heading to gbnews.com forward slash your say or tweet me at gbnews while you're there and why not vote in our poll? I'll bring you those results in just a few minutes. But first, to do battle on this, I'm joined by the trans teacher and journalist Debbie Hayson and human rights activist Peter Tatchell. Peter, let's start with you, my friend. Four years old, is it OK to ask them if they're gay or trans? Well, this is about an education programme in schools to combat bullying and prejudice. It's very much required because there are shocking levels of homophobia, biphobia and transphobia in Scottish schools. Between 13 and 19% of all LGBT plus kids in Scotland leave school prematurely because of the hostility they face. Only one in 10 rate their school experience as good. So this is all about combating prejudice and bullying. It is not forcing anybody to do anything. The scheme is entirely optional. It's voluntary. No one is forced to participate. Where it does take place, it takes place with the support and agreement of the pupils, primarily and almost okay. entirely secondary school pupils, not primary school. OK, right, let, so let, let me just clarify. You are happy with asking four-year-old kids if they're gay, bi or trans? There's no evidence that's being done. I searched to try and find evidence of that. 
There's no evidence that Yes, there happening. is. Peter, let me, let me tell you something. LG, this is from LGBT Youth Scotland's own documents. You can see it on their website. It's on the screen now, if anyone's watching at home. It's that the charity says 200 Scottish secondaries, more than half of the national total, and over 40 primary schools, primary schools being four, five, six-year-olds, have joined its LGBT Charter for Education. In the paperwork, it says, quote, you should consider asking pupils if they are part of the LGBT community in order to uh, establish whether bullying affects those people. Do you agree with that, Peter Satchel? I do not agree with four-year-olds or five-year-olds being Good. asked those questions. And indeed, that document is intended for secondary levels, no, not, it's not primary Peter, levels. I've just, I've just said to you, it's 40 primary schools as well. Debbie yes, Hayes, what do you make of specific questions are only for secondary school pupils. And it's, I would say that that is not appropriate for primary school. The LGBT Youth Scotland is pioneered by a principle of age-appropriate education. OK. So they would not ask those questions of very young children. OK, well, that's not what the document says. But, Debbie Hayton, let me get your thoughts on this. What do you make of this LGBT Youth Scotland and the fact that they are potentially asking four, five, six-year-olds whether they want to be gay, bi or trans? I'd argue you shouldn't be asking them or even speaking to them about heterosexual relationships. Let kids be kids. Why do you want to talk about sex and relationships with young kids? Well, you should be letting children grow up. If there's issues with bullying, let's deal with the bullying. But we shouldn't be imposing on any children this uh, belief system that they've got to choose an identity, choose a team in which to uh, be a member of or be an ally of another team. These are children, and children need the space to grow up before we start imposing adult, uh, adult ideas on them about relationships. Let them grow up first, please. Peter, what age is, it, is acceptable for you to start speaking to kids about whether they're gay, bi or trans? I would say at secondary level, because already by that age, some young people are aware that they're LGB or T. So what age is that? Can you just confirm? Sorry? What age would that be? Secondary, like, so 10, so 11, 12? 11, 11, 12. But no one should be forced or pressured. This should be an option. They shouldn't be actually asked the question. They should be invited to come to classes and where LGBT issues are discussed. It's up to them whether they disclose it or not. No one should be pressured. It should be entirely voluntary. This is not about indoctrination. This is about supporting LGBT plus kids in Scotland, who, as I said, get a very raw deal. There's so much bullying. We need to encourage understanding and acceptance to end that bullying. So educating young LGBT kids and young straight kids about that is a good way to do it because the evidence shows that where this program has been implemented, LGBT plus kids feel much better about themselves, there's less bullying, they stay on longer at school, they don't feel forced to leave. So that's a win, win, win for everyone. Debbie Hayton, same question to you as a trans woman. What is an acceptable age to start asking kids about sex and sexual relationships? Well, I think you've said that, asking them about, about sex and sexual relationships. What we should be teaching children at an appropriate age is about relationships and about those relationships. What worries me about uh, the pack that I've seen here is that it's asking children, where do you fit into this? And that's what we shouldn't be doing. That's not the role of schools. Schools are there to teach children, uh, not to ask children, where do, you, where, do you, where do you fit into this? Now, which age this is coming in at is a, is a matter of conjecture. But my concern would be that too soon, children feel obliged to pick a team, choose, an, choose a letter to identify with or support. That's what I'm concerned about. Peter, I mean, as we've seen with the, the cast review and puberty blockers at the Tavistock in England, you know, a, a lot of these young kids are confused, vulnerable, unhappy for various reasons. I mean, 35% of them at the Tavistock were reported to have autism, for example. I, I just... I'm concerned and worried that we're polluting kids' minds with information on sex and, you know, relationships, not just trans or, or gay relationships, any kind of sexual relationship. Just let kids be kids. Why can't... I mean, what is it with adults who, who want to speak to kids about sex? What's going on there? I just don't get it. It blows my mind. I agree primary school kids should not be discussing sex. And indeed, in my experience, the schools that I go into, at primary level, they just talk about bodily changes at puberty, they talk about different kinds of families. Some will be mum and dad, some will be same-sex parents, some will be single parents. They do not talk about sex. That's scaremongering. Quite rightly, sex is, should be off the agenda when it comes to uh, primary school pupils. But when it comes to secondary pupils, when they're older, maybe 14, 15 or 16, 
we do have to talk about sex, about preventing unwanted pregnancies. Well, that's a different ball game. Preventing of STIs and HIV, teaching young people about consent so that people are not pressured into sex, that people have a right to say no to sex. And those are the things that are being taught in schools in Scotland and in England, Wales as well. And that's a good thing because it's all about young people's welfare. We okay, want well, young uh, people to have happy, healthy relationships. We want to end abuse, we want to end uh, the unwanted pregnancies and yep. sexually traumatic infections. Those are not good things, and to avoid them, young people need education. OK. All right, Peter, look, I'm, I'm glad, in all honesty, you agree that four-year-olds shouldn't be spoken to about whether they're gay, bi or trans, but the, the facts speak for themselves. The story is true because it's from this charity's own paperwork. They are, there are 40 primary schools, children of four, five years, six-year-olds, who are being spoken to by adults about whether they're gay, bi or trans. It's an absolute scandal. Yeah, and I just, not in primary I, school, Ben. Not, not in primary school. Peter, read the paperwork. It's all there in black and white. I don't know why it, you keep saying that. It doesn't they, say primary school. Yeah. That's meant for secondary school. It does. I'm sorry, Peter, it does. I, I've said to you it does. It's 40 primary primary schools and half of the nation's secondary schools. Peter Thatchell, thank you for joining us. Debbie Hayton, appreciate you being with us. Uh, a quick word from the Scottish Government. They've said in a statement to us, we are committed to doing everything we can to make Scotland the best place to grow up for LGBTQI plus young people. This includes funding LGBT Youth Scotland to deliver a range of projects such as LGBT Charter Programme. Very, very good, very good. Uh, we reached out to LGBT Youth Scotland for comment, but received no response. Uh, let's see what you've been saying. Who do you agree with? Is it wrong for pupils as young as four to be asked if they're gay, lesbian or trans? Barry on X says, anyone asking a kid as young as four if they're gay, lesbian or trans needs to be put on a watch list and banned from being allowed anywhere near a primary school. Barry, I think I agree with you. Matt on X says, as a gay man myself, the more these people whip up tensions, the more the likes of me and many others will get caught in the crossfire and treat as if we endorse this madness when we don't. It needs to stop. It needs to stop. Uh, and your verdict is now in. Absolutely emphatic. 95% of you agree that it's wrong for pupils as young as four to be asked if they're gay, lesbian or trans. 5% of you, may I say, who are you, the 5%? 5% of you say that is OK. Actually, that's quite concerning. I was hoping for 100%. But anyway, coming up, the Times reports that Angela Rayner will use a 15 to £23,000 kitchen to prove she was exempt from paying capital gains tax on her council house. We have pictures of that said kitchen as well. I'd like to see what you think. Uh, it cost a pretty penny, and uh, we're going to show you those snaps in just a, a short while with political firebrand Anne Widdicombe, who's on standby. But next, Prince Harry made the US his primary country of residence on the very same date he was evicted from, uh, by his father from Fog uh, Frogmore Cottage in Windsor Park. So was that a veiled dig at the cancer-stricken king? Editor-at-large at the Mail on Sunday, Charlotte Griffiths, has plenty to share on that and an exclusive bombshell about the king's health. She's live in the studio. Don't go anywhere. This is Patrick Christie's Tonight with me, Ben Leo, only on GB News. Evening. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office here on GB News. Tomorrow we'll see, again, plenty of April showers, some sunny spells and a chilly wind in the east. High pressure is slowly edging towards us and it will bring many of us a fine day on Saturday. But for the time being, we've still got low pressure and weather fronts in control. They've been bringing rain across the north through the day and that rain is now trickling southwards. So damp and drizzly for the Midlands, East Anglia and the southeast overnight. The southwest generally staying dry. With more cloud and more breeze, it is going to be a much, much milder night than last night. We started today with a frost in many areas. We'll start tomorrow at seven or eight degrees. A little colder in northern Scotland where there will be a really chilly wind blowing. That will be a feature of the weather right across these eastern areas tomorrow, a cold wind. Elsewhere where we'll start with a lot of clouds, a little bit of rain, but it should brighten up through the day. Certainly a much brighter day for Northern Ireland and especially Western Scotland compared to today. Still a few showers dotted around through the afternoon. And again, it is going to feel chilly, particularly in the east with that wind, 9 or 10 Celsius. 14 or 15 further south. Temperatures will drop sharply on Friday evening, some pockets of frost to start the weekend, but for many it is going to be a fine day on Saturday. Decent amount of sunshine around. A bit more cloud and some patchy rain across northern Scotland. Still a bit breezy across East Anglia in particular, but for many, uh, as I said, a fine day on Saturday. Not spectacularly warm, highs of 10 to 14 degrees. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday.
I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism, when you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it? I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western, free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not being imposed mm. onto the wider society. And when you want, uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between Islam and Islamism, people like me, you and me, we are drawing that distinction. We're trying to maintain that distinction. But if you uh, look at the commentator from the Muslim community, some commentator, they would like to blur this line and they would ask you, what is Islamism? Where does it exist? Sorry, it does exist. Mm. We see it. And the teacher of this incident is an epitome of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our Khadija, society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. Patrick Christie tonight, only on GB News with me, Ben Leo. Coming up, as Angela Rayner's capital gains tax scandal continues to snowball, does she risk torpedoing Labour's electoral open goal? Political legend Anne Widdicombe gives her expert analysis shortly. But first, it's time for the Royal Dispatch with the man on Sunday's Charlotte Griffiths. And in a bombshell story Charlotte's broke over the weekend, it was revealed that King Charles was shockingly duped by a senior aide into signing a document appointing a colleague to a job at the palace, despite staff being instructed not to burden him as he was recovering from a, ground, uh, from a, a round of gruelling cancer treatment. So the King's private secretary has been forced to uh, since put an awkward U-turn on the appointment. Meanwhile, Prince Harry, remember him? He appears to have fully turned his back on the UK as he listed his primary residence as the United States for the very first time in papers published yesterday. So, interestingly, Harry listed the dates on the formal US residency forms as the 29th of June 2023, last year. So that was the very same day he was kicked out of Frogmore Cottage in Great Windsor Park by his dad, the King. Charlotte, thank you for joining me. Okay. Are we just putting two and two together here with the significance of this date? Because there were stories during the rounds today that Harry chose that date specifically because he was so hurt mm -hmm. about being booted out of Frogmore by his dad. Yeah, I mean, to me, it feels like he's trolling his dad a bit because he could have said that he's been a US resident since 2020 when he quit the UK and moved to the States. But instead, he chose the exact day that his dad kicked him out of Frogmore. But the reason his dad kicked him out of Frogmore was because he'd slagged off Camilla in Spain. Mm. And, you know, and his dad, apparently, it was a really difficult decision for Charles because, of course, no dad wants to kick their son out of their home. But he went beyond the pale. So Charles took the difficult decision to say, look, Frogmore's been empty for years anyway. We've spent £2.4 million doing it up for you. And now you've, you know, insulted our family in your book's spare. So he just, he just cut, cut, cut Harry off then. But Harry, of course, was incensed by this move. And now we discover that a company's house document he filed only yesterday puts that exact date down. And, you know, nothing is by chance with Harry. I wouldn't put it past him to have deliberately put that in there to spite the, his father. The thing that gets me right is Harry and Meghan left the UK. They said, we're going to focus on a new life away from the hellhole in England and all the trauma we've been through with the royal family. All they seem to have done since then is look back and complain about the way they were treated, uh, dish the dirt on their family. Mm. And if this is right, if reports are right that he chose this date to have a dig at the king, mm. it's just another act of his 
really quite venge vengeful nature. Yeah, I mean, he's kind of spiteful and he, as you say, he can't let go of the past. And why is he so hung up on Frogmore? Because this is the country he was desperate to get away from. This is a house he didn't particularly want to live in and, in fact, didn't live in. Well, he was, he was forced, by the way, to pay two and a half million pounds to fund the renovations after it all kicked off. I mean, would that have anything to do with... Yeah, I mean, I'm sure own... that sort of galvanised his um, anger towards the whole situation. He thought he was getting a fantastic free freebie. And there was, uh, you know, there were a few reports at the time that, she, that Megan actually thought she was m moving into Frogmore House, which is a much grander property, and she sort of felt a bit sort of tricked or confused and, and hadn't mm. quite realised it was actually a cottage, which is only a mere, I think it was only a mere eight bedrooms. OK, well, we're going to get on to Prince William, his brother, in a minute, who's been doing some rather stellar work in stark contrast to mm -hmm. Harry. But briefly tell me about this bombshell exclusive you had in the <laughs> Mail on Sunday at the weekend. Well, this is, this is a story about you know, a mischievous herald, OK, so he's a member of the royal household, and he wanted to get a man appointed into a role. Right. And so what he did was he got it under the nose of the king while the king was in London. And what I discovered in this report was that I now know that when the king is in London, it's only to do one thing, it's to see his doctors and have cancer treatment. So whether knowingly or unknowingly, this herald got the document under the nose of Charles just after he'd had some cancer treatment and and Charles signed off on it and really there was a huge row behind the scenes because everyone knows there's a very strict protocol which actually I didn't know about until I did the story but there's a very strict protocol now so if the king's in London he's not really doing any official documents or official work and he this guy had circumnavigated the 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 protocol to get his get his own way which is sort of a side point the main point is this new revelation which is that the king is in London for one thing and one thing only so the King, just to clarify, he was, let's say, not totally with it after his cancer treatment. Yeah, I think And he was, he was bounced tired. into signing this bit of paper. I mean, what does that say about the security and the future of the monarchy if you've got courtiers, is that a fair yeah, way to describe yeah, them, no, totally. shoving paperwork under his nose when he's, you know, trying to recover from quite serious treatment? Yeah, well, I think it does. I mean, I think a lot of questions were asked, which is how it's made, it made its way to me. But um, trust me, Palisades went ballistic and the two private secretaries that look yeah. after Charles reversed the decision, you turned it, and now the protocols are going to be more strict than ever okay. um, to make sure it doesn't happen again. All right, some more positive news. Earlier today, Prince William, I'm sure you've seen, he's been out and about making his first public appearance since uh, Catherine revealed her tragic cancer diagnosis. So he visited a food charity in Surrey and a youth centre in West London. There he is with a crate of bananas. Good man. Wow. Uh, and, yeah, he seemed eager to, to get stuck in. He received two Get Well Soon cards for the King and Princess Kate as they both continue their recoveries from cancer. Is William setting an example for his brother, Harry, by cracking on with royal life. Meanwhile, Harry's, you know, he's got a new Netflix series. Yeah. He's kind of, you know, not really living up to his royal potential. Totally. I mean, gosh, it's chalk and cheese because Harry's over promoting his new series, um, posing up for the Netflix cameras at polo matches. Meghan is marketing her new jam. Uh, and meanwhile... Oh, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> American Orchard American Riviera. Riviera Orchard. Make your mind up. Um, so she's giving her jam away for free, but to very, very wealthy people, such as the boss of Paramount Studios and all her wealthy influencer friends. Meanwhile, over here, William is giving away food to people who actually need it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, is donning his high-vis jacket and his apron. And it's, it's just a tale of two two brothers got, that have gone in very different directions. And Harry's all about money and marketing now, I guess. Just very quickly, 15 seconds. Do you think Harry ever looks back at what William's getting up to back here, cracking on with royal duties and, you know, resents? Well, we know he looks back. Yeah, I think he looks back and I think he thinks, well, I've gone down this path now, it's too late to U-turn. But, I, you know, he is quite a charitable soul at heart. I bet he's, he's missing out on these, uh, these yeah. opportunities to be gracious. All right, Charlotte Griffiths, editor-at-large at the Mail on Sunday, royal scoop getter. Thank you very much. Thanks. Coming up, a failed asylum seeker whose deportation was blocked by airline cabin crew from Air France, by the way, who else, has just pleaded guilty to the rape of a 15-year-old British teenage girl. So are do-gooder lefties putting dangerous men on the streets of Britain? Don't miss that at 10 o'clock. But next, will a £23,000 kitchen exonerate Angela Rayner over the council investigation? Plus, Jeremy Hunt sticks the boot into his former boss. Um, she was only there for... Uh, less than 50 days. Um, I had a little bit longer when I knew I was going to be moving in there. A sly little dig there from the Chancellor. So has Liz Truss got a future in the Conservative Party? No nonsense. Anne Widdicombe answers all of that and more straight after this. GB News.
Breakfast. Breakfast. Every day from 6 a.m. Cheryl Baker. Good morning, Cheryl. Good morning. When you think back to 1981, um, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the ABBA victory <laughs> then wasn't all that long ago, nine years earlier. Do, do you think they had a huge influence then on the sort of direction that, that Eurovision was taking? Yeah, they did. They changed it completely. Because up to then, it had all been very staid and a bit posh, long frock, sticky bow ties, you know. And then they came along and they blew it out of the water. They looked so different. And they modernised it. And I think, yeah, it, it, it made a big change. Made a big change after that. Mm. And we were watching your performance on Eurovision a little bit earlier on of Making Your Mind Up. I mean, you had so much fun, didn't you, up on that stage. Were you, in some part, inspired by ABBA? Um, yes, I would say so. It was... ABBA was 74. I turned professional in 75 and um, did my first song for Europe, which was, you know, the when they choose the British song to go forward. Um, I did my first one in February 1976. So, yeah, it was only months after ABBA's performance that I um, I started my own Eurovision journey. Um, yeah, they, they just changed the face of it. They changed the face of Eurovision. And if you look at what Eurovision is now, I think that all started with ABBA's performance. It made people think this is much more than just a song contest. It's all about the look. I mean, the clothes, because they looked fantastic. And even the composer, or not the composer, what's he called? The conductor. He was dressed as Napoleon. It, was, it made it fun. Fantastic song, obviously. Brilliant singing. But the whole look of it just changed the way that Eurovision is, and, and to this day. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. It's Patrick Christie's tonight with me, Ben Leo, only on GB News. Still to come tonight, a failed asylum seeker, and you're not going to want to miss this, whose deportation was blocked by French cabin crew, now pleads guilty to raping a 15-year-old British girl. But first, we welcome former Tory minister Anne Widdecombe and further developments on the Angela Rayner council house scandal. Labour's deputy leader is facing fresh questions over whether capital gains tax may be owed on a second property. If she was exempt from capital gains tax on the sale of her first Stockport council house in 2015, it would mean her husband should have paid the tax on the property he sold the following year. Police are now investigating multiple allegations against Angela Rayner, with at least a dozen officers assigned to the case. Meanwhile, sources have briefed The Times that she's expected to claim exemption from capital gains after offsetting the tax with a kitchen renovation. So to qualify... <laughs> The kitchen pictured by Zoopla when she sold the house would have apparently had to be worth between 15 and 23,000 pounds. And there's the pictures on the screen. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to comment. Just make your own minds up. Is that a 23 grand kitchen? Who knows? Uh, Anne Whittacombe, are you with us? Angela Rayner denies. Yeah. Angela denies any wrongdoing. But I want to know, is Sir Keir Starmer jeopardising Labour's electoral open goal by continuing to back her on this before well, exactly. he's got a full they answer? Well, handled it very badly. I mean, there's no doubt at all in my mind that uh, she should have published the tax advice. Now, I don't call upon people to publish their personal taxes, but she does. And she has done so with Conservatives in the past. So I don't see why she should have been different. But if they published the tax advice, and if it was definitive, uh, that would have closed the matter down. Uh, the fact that Keir Starmer doesn't even appear to have seen that tax advice for himself, um, I think, means that, that he just 
isn't handling this well. Uh, and of course, it gets more complicated as you go along and new allegations come along every five minutes. Uh, and so we must now wait for the police investigation. But I would stress that, as I have done uh, on other programmes, uh, that she is entitled to a presumption of innocence until proved guilty. Yeah, of course. But my only concern is there's been such a... There's a position from the Labour types and the left who say this isn't even a story worth discussing. Of course, Angela Rayner is innocent until proven guilty. But I've had so much slack online in recent weeks for even saying, oh, look, a new development in the Rayner story. So many people think this isn't even worthy of discussion because she's, you know, somehow a working-class girl done good. No, I mean, the, the nonsense about how everybody's having a go at her because she's working class uh, is just uh, utterly ridiculous. You've got the same claim in reverse being made today by a lawyer uh, in the case of the uh, the dead baby and, and the aristocrat, where he says, oh, well, you know, she's being uh, um, persecuted because she's upper class. Now, class has nothing to do with it at all, whether working middle or upper. She either did or didn't. Uh, do the right thing with her taxes, and that's the only question. The police are looking at it. Yeah. They will be able to answer it definitively, you know, which the rest of us can't because she hasn't published it well. OK, well, Rayner has said in a statement, I've repeatedly said I would welcome the chance to sit down with the appropriate authorities, including the police and HMRC, to assess out the facts and draw a line under this. I'm completely confident I've followed the rules at all times. I will say, as I did before, if I committed a criminal offence, I would, of course, do the right thing and step down. I mean, let's just remind ourselves, when uh, Boris Johnson was caught eating crusty m and sandwiches in Downing Street, she called for him to resign upon only police investigation. But there we are. Um, separately, and let me just show you this clip from the Chancellor, Jerry, Jeremy Hunt, talking about uh, Liz Truss. First of all, is Downing Street really infested with fleas? We, we have to know. Um, I, had, I actually uh, live in the flat that Liz Truss lived in and Boris Johnson lived in before that. Um, she was only there for uh, less than 50 days. Um, I had a little bit longer when I knew I was going to be moving in there and I replaced all the carpets at my own expense, vast expense, because it had to be a security cleared company that did it. So um, I'm pleased to say that the Hunt family has not had the flea problem. And in 15 seconds, does Liz Truss have a future in the Conservative Party? Very, very quickly, please. Very much depends on what happens at the next election, if they're wiped out and if the right is resurgent, it's possible. Otherwise, I would have thought it unlikely. OK, great stuff. All right, Anne Whittacombe, Conservative Firebrand, former Tory minister, thanks so much. Uh, we're going to get some weather now, but a big hour coming up next, including that failed asylum seeker from the Congo who went on to rape a 15-year-old British girl. More on that in just a minute. First, here's your weather. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Evening. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office here on GB News. Tomorrow we'll see again plenty of April showers, some sunny spells and a chilly wind in the east. High pressure is slowly edging towards us and it will bring many of us a fine day on Saturday. But for the time being, we've still got low pressure and weather fronts in control. They've been bringing rain across the north through the day and that rain is now trickling southwards. So damp and drizzly for the Midlands, East Anglia and the southeast overnight. The southwest generally staying dry. With more cloud and more breeze, it is going to be a much, much milder night than last night. We we started today with a frost in many areas. We'll start tomorrow at 7 or 8 degrees. A little colder in northern Scotland where there will be a really chilly wind blowing. That will be a feature of the weather right across these eastern areas tomorrow, a cold wind. Elsewhere, we'll start with a lot of clouds, a little bit of rain, but it should brighten up through the day. Certainly a much brighter day for Northern Ireland and especially western Scotland compared to today. Still a few showers dotted around through the afternoon and again, it is going to feel chilly, particularly in the east with that wind, 9 or 10 Celsius. 14 or 15 further south. Temperatures will drop sharply on Friday evening, some pockets of frost to start the weekend, but for many it is going to be a fine day on Saturday. Decent amount of sunshine around. A bit more cloud and some patchy rain across northern Scotland. Still a bit breezy across the East Anglia in particular, but for many, uh, as I said, a fine day on Saturday. Not spectacularly warm, highs of 10 to 14 degrees. Looks like things are heating up. Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News.
Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Ellie Costello and thank you so much for joining us here on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's 10 p.m. This is Patrick Christie's tonight's with me, Ben Leo. Going to die. Definitely, they want to kill him. What happens when do-gooder plane passengers stop asylum seekers from being deported? Well, let me tell you, one of them went to rape a British teenager. Very well done. I think it is completely unforgivable in the face of complete climate catastrophe. And surprise, surprise, the SNP's dropped its deranged net zero target. So is that man, Hamza Youssef, Britain's biggest hypocrite? And big news breaking tonight. Nicola Sturgeon's husband has been charged in connection with the police investigation into the SNP's finances. Meanwhile, over at Westminster... Uh, 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 no, 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 no. Chaos in the Commons amid the excess death scandal. And Rishi rose back on his spring Rwanda pledge. I've got tomorrow's newspaper front pages and a top panel to boot. Tonight, I'm joined by star columnist at The Telegraph, Alison Pearson, ex-Labour advisor, Matthew Laza, and GB News superstar presenter, Nana Aquir. Strap yourselves in. Let's do this. Do good at lefties putting rapists on our streets. Next. It's one minute after ten. I'm Polly Middlehurst with the latest GB News. And it's understood that Nicola Sturgeon's husband, Peter Murrell, has been charged in connection with embezzlement of funds from the Scottish National Party following an investigation into the party's finances. The former SNP chief executive was re-arrested this morning, around nine o'clock, we understand, with Police Scotland saying he was questioned by detectives, but he's no longer in police custody. He'd previously been arrested and then released without charge last April. It's also understood this evening that he has resigned his SNP membership. A spokesperson for the party said it was a shock but couldn't comment further. The UK and the United States have announced a raft of new sanctions on a number of Iranian individuals in response to the country's drone and missile attack on Israel at the weekend. Lord Cameron was meeting with G7 leaders today in Italy and he said the action demonstrated the UK's unequivocal condemnation of Iran's attack on a sovereign state. He said not only was Iran's reckless attack a total failure, but they've revealed to the world their true nature as a malign influence in 
in the region. Britain's also freezing the assets of some Iranian organisation, including some individuals in the Navy and the Army. That adds to more than 400 sanctions already imposed on Iranian assets. Iran's behaviour is unacceptable and it's right that countries come together here at the G7 and make those points, not just because of what Iran has been doing, but also as a message to Israel that we want to play our part in having a coordinated strategy that deals with uh, Iran's aggression that we saw so clearly against Israel over the weekend. Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron there. Now, a criminal gang involved in a website which actually taught subscribers how to defraud thousands of victims has been shut down by police. 480,000 card numbers belonging to as many as 70,000 people were accessed via the website, which was called Lab Post, with criminals subscribing to the site so they could be taught how to access bank details and PIN numbers. LNER train drivers have announced another strike this weekend on Saturday, to be precise, leading to the cancellation of around three and four services. Members of ASLEF will also walk out for the day and ban overtime over the weekend in a fresh dispute over terms and conditions. The rail operator says it'll run just 26% of its usual routes between London, Edinburgh and West Yorkshire. The walkouts are separate to the long-running dispute over pay between ASLEF and 16 other train operators. And finally, Team GB unveiled its brand new Olympic kit today ahead of the Paris Games this summer. The kit features the classic red, white and blue British colours and Adidas, who produced the clothing, said the aim was to create a design that celebrated the unique aspects of Great Britain whilst also encapsulating the passion within each and every athlete. For the latest news, do sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thanks, Polly. Right, so nearly 20 years ago, we had an illegal migrant on a flight about to be sent to the... Well, sent the hell out of our country, to be frank. But his deportation was blocked by a do-gooder cabin crew from Air France, no less. Fast forward to today, and that same migrant has just pleaded guilty to the rape of a 15-year-old British girl. So, meet Anisette Maella. Here he is. As you can see, he became a poster boy for the anti-deportation movement and campaigners after using human rights laws to fight his return to the Republic of the Congo. Maella arrived in the UK in 2004 after paying an agent to smuggle him out of East Africa, where he claimed his life was at risk. In May 2005, he was put on a flight back to the Congan capital, Brazzaville, but the crew prevented the jet's takeoff from Southampton amid claims Deportation minders had taped Maella's legs together and handcuffed him, breaking his hand. So, just to reiterate, the airline that thwarted the Home Office that day was Air France. How appropriate, bearing in mind what's going on now with the small boats crisis. A month later, Maella won leave to remain in the UK, where, as you've already heard, he would go on to rape a 15-year-old teenage girl. So, let's bring up that image of him again. Where is he? There we go. Migrants are not criminals. There he is, protesting in a scene that open border fanatics would undoubtedly get behind. Around his neck, as you can see, for radio listeners, reads a sign, migrants are not criminals. Let's be honest, the vast majority of migrants aren't criminals, but that guy definitely was. He was a dangerous sex attacker, in fact, and we had him on a one-way ticket back to his home country until a bunch of lefty social justice warriors thought they knew better. And here's a shock for you. They didn't. Let's get some reaction now from Conservative MP for East Worthing and Shoreham, Tim Lawson. Actually, Tim, you're my former MP. Very sad to see you're standing down, actually, but I'll ask you about that at the end. In the case of this... I was about to call him a gentleman, but he's not a gentleman. In the case of this man, Tim, left the protesters, and it was actually Air France cabin crew, believe it or not, stopped him leaving the country, thwarted the democratic process, thwarted the British justice system, and he was allowed to stay in the UK and go on to rape. This is an absolute scandal. And let me say, it's not the only case either. I think that's the point, Ben. I mean, this happened quite a while ago, and now he's gone on to uh, offend. The real issue is that this is not an isolated incident, and we've had many more, more recent uh, cases where not just cabin crew, but even passengers have uh, have intervened 
to uh, stop somebody being uh, deported, who's got a criminal uh, record, who's got absolutely no right to be in the country. It's legitimately they are being uh, deported and they've been taken off a plane. We've had Labour MPs signing letters petitioning for various people not to be deported, who then turn out to be criminals and commit criminal acts as, uh, as well. So he's absolutely right in that sign, which there's migrants are not criminals, but some are, he was, and he shouldn't have been allowed to commit his criminal acts in this country when he was legitimately going to be deported. So Robert Jenrick, the former immigration minister, he was speaking last night and he said that, uh, to quote, the UK needs a more robust policy uh, because a handful of symbolic flights to East Africa, talking about Rwanda, uh, we're moving on to the small boats issue, uh, wasn't going to be a good enough deterrent. Tim, why can't we just behave like a normal country? Australia did it in the mid-2000s with Tony Abbott and turn back the boats mid-water. Humanely, by the way, putting them into uh, very safe life vessels, uh, lifeboat vessels and either sending them back to where they came from or to offshore processing sites. Uh, if only. And it's a very different situation to uh, Australia. Now, like it or not, we play by the, uh, the rules. When boats leave French shores, and more needs to be done by the French to stop them leaving French shores, or if they do leave uh, French shores, they should be intercepted at sea and brought back to those French shores. So it becomes a completely expensive round trip for migrants paying people smugglers only to be returned to French beaches. That would absolutely kill off this trade stone, stone dead, but the French won't cooperate in, in doing that, which is the nub of this problem. Once those boats come into British territorial waters, like it or not, they become our responsibility. And it's incredible, frankly, given the danger of what's gone on in the channel, that more people haven't lost their lives. It's down to the, uh, the, the good services and the bravery of many of our, our lifeboats, our border force, um, our Coast Guard and others who, who bring them to the UK, as we are duty bound under international law, like it or not, to do. Just as, frankly, the French are duty-bound under international maritime law to intercept those boats because crimes are being committed by paying people smugglers and criminal gangs yeah. to try and get them into the into the country. Frankly, it might be a, a nice, sound a nice idea. You cannot try and turn those boats around uh, at, at sea because then there would be casualties. They shouldn't be leaving the French shores in the first place. Right, Tim, I, I know from first-hand experience you're a good MP, you've held your seat for a number of years, you announced you're stepping down a couple of days ago, you won't be standing at the next election. Is it anything to do with the... I mean, are you embarrassed about the way your party has handled not just illegal migration, but legal migration. You've had total control over it, yet you've allowed the city, a city the size of Birmingham, every two years to, to come into this country. The services aren't sufficient enough to support them. People, I mean, Brits can't get dentist appointments, they can't get GP appointments, school appointments, no one can buy a house anymore. Uh, are you embarrassed and ashamed by the Tories' record on migration? Uh, no, and that hyperbole doesn't help the, uh, uh, the situation. There are two factors... Is it hyperbole? First, there is illegal migration, uh, which we need to be able to do more, but we are in this ridiculous situation where people are paying people smugglers to come across the channel, and once they're in British territorial waters, they are our responsibility. And where you've got people who then cannot be returned to their home country, they come from countries like Iran, Eritrea, where they physically will not let them off the plane, that's when we have a problem. That's why the government is putting so much effort into this Rwanda scheme as a way of getting people out of the country to a third territory, which will be a deterrent. And we've seen why that will be a deterrent, because I think first select committee I sit on have been to France and we've, we've, we've seen what it can, uh, can do. There is an issue with high levels of uh, migration. Again, the government yeah. is taking steps to reduce that, largely because the dependents are coming with people we need in this country, bringing a lot of dependents who, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, don't have a place to be in the country. That is being reduced. But okay. we also depend on quite a lot of migrant labour in our essential services as well. We need to get the balance right. No, I'm not embarrassed, because we're actually doing something uh, about it, because okay. everyone else has just right. cried foul and said this is a disgrace, but come up with no practical solutions, which is what this government is trying to do. OK, Tim, really appreciate you being with us. Good luck for, with your future endeavours. Tim Lawson there, uh, East Worthing and Shoreham Conservative MP. Let's get the thoughts now from our uh, panel tonight. Daily Telegraph columnist Alison Pearson, former Labour Party adviser Matthew Laza, and, of course, GB News 
presenter Nana Aquir. Alison, let's start with you. That story about the migrant who should have been deported, Air France cabin crew no less, were the ones responsible for uh, keeping him here. And he went on to rape a teenage girl in Britain. Yeah, there's a class of person, Ben, I call them the great and the good, the bien pensant. And what they see is they see the human rights of someone like this Congolese guy, OK? It's all about let's not deport him, that's terribly unkind, his human rights. <clears throat> what about the human rights of a 15-year-old British girl to not be raped by the Congolese man? And we see this time and again. We had uh, a couple of years ago, we had a guy called Ernesto Elliott. He was on a plane being deported to Jamaica. All these lovies, Naomi Campbell, actress mm. Tandy Newton, some of the Labour people, Labour MPs, oh, you know, don't support these people, it's absolutely dreadful, poor people. And then this guy goes and murders on the streets of London, uh, a 35-year-old man, now dead, mourned by his parents, because this guy, you know, the nice, the, the nice people... Uh, the nice people stopped the nasty man being sent away. And Ben, I have to say, as a woman and as a mother of a daughter, every single one of these illegal asylum people who play our system, they are presenting a daily threat to British women, mm. OK? And our human rights, as far as I'm concerned, are more important than theirs. Yeah, it's an absolute outrage. And Matthew Laza, correct me if I'm wrong, was it not Keir Starmer who signed a petition calling for a Jamaican asylum seeker mm. to not be <laughs> deported? Well, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, but I don't think that asylum seeker went on to commit offences. It's not the one that Alison uh, has just been uh, talking about. I mean, there are some cases where it's perfectly legitimate. We've seen people campaign uh, uh, rightly to keep people in the country. Look, I think in this case, all our thoughts to begin with must be with the victim of this awful crime. Um, I don't think... Do you know what? Yeah, that, that's very noble of you to say that, mm. but thoughts and prayers don't work anymore, Matthew Laza. People are sick to the no, stomach absolutely. of hearing these types of stories. Yeah. There, was a, there was a Serbian guy, and it was in Bournemouth or Portsmouth mm. last year, He'd murdered two people already in Serbia. He came here, somehow got in, wasn't deported and went to kill a British yeah, lad on a night out. People I mean, don't want yeah, thoughts ben, and prayers no, 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 Ben, what I, think, what I think is the case, I, I think it's not particularly appropriate for um, a cabin crew on a flight to take, to take matters into their own hands. In this instance, there was an issue, because then there were issues about how he was being handled. I think his hand ended up being broken. The, the, the cabin crew have responsibility. Oh, God. But the thing is, he then went back into the British system and then it was, it was then... That the British courts, the, the tribunal system, let him stay, and that's where the well, that's well, where the real thing. That, yeah, but the, because the screening the is happening. Is, and no, letting no, me, no, but no, the, the problem is, is, we're paying for this. We're paying for this. So, so we're paying for these people to have legal challenges, one after the other, challenges that we, as the British people, probably would have to pay for ourselves. And I'm sick to my back teeth of listening to yet another story of another migrant who has done something bad to somebody in this country. Then these liberal lefties or liberal woke -rarty come in and say, oh, this poor person is a victim. I think it's, there's a lack of understanding as to the mentality and mindset of many of the migrants who come to this country. And I think, unfortunately, we have a, a sort of elitist class who don't really think in the same way as the people that they're supposedly rescuing. And you see it with things like uh, the liberal left who worry about white privilege and all that. And it's they who are writing the narrative. It's not black people that are mm. mostly... It's mostly coming from white liberals. And, and I've got to say, here we go again. You, these people wouldn't go to Ghana. You, you come to Africa, you come to Ghana, they'll say, well, you fine, make your own way. Legal, we're not paying for your legal fees. Get your own food, get your own shelter. Why are we so accommodating for the, in yeah. this way? We're actually drawing oh, no. people to this well, country. We're well, doing absolutely. it. Absolutely. Well, we you can talk, because what, what will your people right, can do? Right, what right, are right, Labour right. going to do? Well, I think well, we what we need are they a system do? which processes applications, but we also need a system where, the, where, 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 where when people are in it, uh, they're assessed. I don't understand why this guy was assessed one way, and then suddenly he's off the flight and he's assessed that he can stay. The system is collapsing. You're coming through. Just... Asylum system is just a complete yeah, racket. It doesn't we work. saw that with yeah. Abdul Mahdi. So on his third rejection, suddenly decided he was a Christian yeah, and I they mean, let they're, him they're, stay. They're, they're, these, these, these people, they're so virtuous and they're, they're, you know, they're the good guys, aren't they? But whenever stories like this pop up, they uh, they remain quiet and go AWOL. So interesting, isn't it? Um, coming up, sticking on migration, Rishi Sunak, he's quietly dropped his pledge to have Rwanda flights off the ground by spring. But will the Lords let them take off at all? Also, disorder in the House of Commons. Uh, 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 no, 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 no. Sounds like a football match, doesn't it? Find out why Parliament sounded more like Wembley Stadium there, uh, along with the very first of tomorrow's front pages very, very shortly. But first, as even the greenwashed Scottish Government drops its world-leading target to reduce carbon emissions by 75% by 2030, is net zero the deranged march to it, 
ultimately unachievable. I take on Professor Christian Dunn next. This is Patrick Christie's Tonight with me, Ben Leo, only on GB News. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3pm. J.K. Rowling has accused politicians of snuggling up to trans campaigners. The Harry Potter author has called for an investigation into why political parties are embracing the language of pro-trans groups. So is it time to ditch campaign groups such as those? Well, welcome again to Michael Asher's former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza, and also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. I think the cast report is really welcome. I think there's been a huge amount of agreement, including from some uh, trans rights campaigners, that there's an awful lot of good in the cast report. I, I think that I'm more concerned about Mermaids, which is currently under a charity commission uh, investigation, uh, and some of the reports, if they're to be believed, like sending out chest binders, are more alarming. Mm. I think on Stonewall, which has been has done such great work uh, uh, over the past 30 years uh, uh, on LGBT rights... You said two-year-olds could be trans. Now, that, that is one of the most horrifying things I read today. Actually, J.K. Rowling tweeted that out there. To say that a two-year-old can think that they can be another gender when my four-year-old still thinks she's Elsa on some days. You yeah. know, there's no common sense. And, and it, to me, it's I very... I think it was very badly phrased, it's, very, it's very sinister that these people actually believe that these kids want to change gender. And, and unfortunately, out there, there are parents that almost see a trans kid as a fashion accessory now. And I think this whole... Um, agenda has pushed on people that this is normal to change gender and we have to push back and as I said earlier to be trans is not normal. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't agree it's with that extreme. I think, no, I think it's, it's I think extreme. It's a big step, Adam, but there are clearly people throughout history uh, uh, who, who have uh, been But it's trans. not normal behaviour, is it? I think, for, I think as far as children are concerned, children need to be given the space uh, to, um, uh, to explore the world, and that can mm. include experimenting with, uh, you know, um, uh, breaking previous gender stereotypes. That doesn't mean that people should be sort of labelled at the age of two, which I completely uh, disagree mm. with. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Neil Oliver, every Sunday night at 6pm on GB News. And if an hour is not nearly enough for you, go to gbnews.com for special extended episodes online every Friday at 9pm, where we can truly get into the nitty gritty of what's going on. GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Bev Turner. Thank you for joining us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. This is Patrick Christie's Tonight with me, Ben Leo, only on GB News. A very first look at all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages coming up. But first, the Scottish Government has today been forced into a humiliating U-turn by scrapping its, quote, world-leading pledge to cut carbon emissions by 75% by 2030 after years of repeatedly missing targets. That's despite, by the way, Hamza Youssef and Nicola Sturgeon both trumpeting Scotland as a global leader on climate action. So, look, it's a well-trodden path. Rishi Sunak also rode back on his government's climate commitments, commitments last year, pushing back the deadline for selling new petrol and diesel cars and watering down the phasing out of gas boilers. So, what did Scottish First Minister Hamza Youssef make of Sunak's decision at the time? I think it is completely unforgivable for the UK government, for the Prime Minister, in the face of complete climate catastrophe, as we've seen particularly over the course of the summer, to roll back on commitments to reach uh, net zero. I'm, so <laughs> I'm sorry. What an absolute 
hypocrite. How anyone can take that guy seriously, I don't know. And I was thinking about this earlier. To, to, to think that people vote for this man, is, it blows my mind. But look, uh, I'm joined now by senior lecturer in natural sciences at the University of Bangor, Dr Christian Dunn. Good evening, Christian. Thank you for joining me. So let me just ask you, is net zero dead in the water? Is this decision by the SNP the first domino to fall and the first admission that actually net zero is just going to make us colder and poorer? Um, well, I hope not in many ways, because will we have to get to net zero? Uh, I mean, that's just fundamentally we have to. How quickly we do that, though, I think um, um, countries, leaders and even companies as well are finding just how tough it is going to be um, because we have become completely wedded to fossil fuels and to decouple ourselves is going to take unfortunately huge investment um there are tremendous positives in other ways if we can get there um but i think it's it's far trickier than we would like it to be Christian, can I just be completely frank with you? The UK's global carbon emissions are less than 1%, right? We've reduced emissions by around is it 40% over the last couple of decades. Meanwhile, China are building new coal power stations, I think two every week. India's ploughing forward with coal power station plans. What's the point of British people making themselves poorer and skinter just to fund the coffers of the Green Lobby? Yes, um, I, I, I understand that argument. Um, my, my response would be just because other countries aren't doing the right thing doesn't mean that we shouldn't do the right thing either. We, we should be doing the right thing um, and hope that the other countries um, uh, st take a lead from what we are doing. Um, but And then when it comes to, you know, we are going to be poor, et cetera, et cetera, if done incorrectly, net zero could do that. And this is why I think that we have to take a more holistic and more nuanced approach to reaching net zero. Perhaps having targets of specific dates um, makes that harder to do. And perhaps we should be moving forward uh, in a more pragmatic way where we can. But also what we, I think we should be doing, and people like myself that believe fundamentally in net zero, is it, taking the public with us. And I think that has perhaps not worked a lot of the time. Um, it's been a little bit more kind of could be seen as more preaching and telling people what to do rather than trying to bring the people with us and show them the, the additional benefits of reaching net zero. And, and Christian, you say you need to take the public with you on this march to net zero, but I mean, I always ask climate scientists and climate alarmists this same question. How can the public and those on the other side of the debate take the argument seriously when so many previous predictions from yesteryear on climate annihilation have been, you know, passed without a whimper. For example, in 2000, senior climate scientist David Viner said that um, climate change was so bad that kids just aren't going to know what snow is by the year 2020. In 2018, Greta Thunberg tweeted that humanity would be wiped out if we didn't stop using fossil fuels within five years. In 2004, The Guardian reported on a Pentagon climate report that said Britain would have a Siberian climate by 2019. Prince Charles in 2009 said we had just 96 months to save the world. How are you going to get the public on board with you when people make such you know, frankly, quite ridiculous predictions every year. Well, well and those are individual uh, people, and most of them weren't scientists as well that you just quoted as well. Um, so not environmental scientists in the slightest. Well, no, sorry, um, sorry let, let me just pick you up on that. Na NASA scientists and UN uh, climate scientists are quoted in that as well. In, in 1978, right. the UN said something similar. Not, and neither is King Charles. Um, but that, that, that being said, the IPCC, which releases the report, which is the consensus of, of, of hundreds of of scientists is is not like that it's not that alarmist but people don't really know that because they don't really read the massive report that is produced there um but my an issue that i always have as well in britain it's really easy for us to say well climate change isn't affecting us or well, who cares I, I do research in vietnam in the mekong delta and there there are farmers whose livelihood is being affected now because of climate change and I think that we forget about that. In Britain, it's very easy for, for us to forget about it. But in other parts of the world, it is not that easy to forget if you can't feed your family because sea level rise has, effect, has made that you can't grow your crops. And so it's so easy for us to go, oh, for goodness sake, well, it's just costing us a bit of money. 
Well, yeah, it might do. Yeah, but, but... Chris, Christian, the, 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 arguments, the arguments is that these people like China and India, they're not going to change their ways. So, you know, why should we bother when it's not us responsible for it in the first place? You're talking about Vietnam, China's next door. Tell them to stop building coal power stations. Very Last word, very quickly. I think it's a weak argument to um, just say just because <laughs> other countries aren't doing something, we shouldn't do it. And okay. uh, that's a, yes, that's, well, that would be my last word. All right, great stuff. That was Senior Lecturer in Natural Sciences at the University of Bangor, Dr. Christian Dunn. Thank you so much. Coming up, as Richie Sunak fails in his promise to get Rwanda flights off the ground by spring, has the PM been an abject failure? Plus, I'm glad this cyclist is wearing a helmet. Oh, ouch. But next, tonight's panel return to run us through the very first of tomorrow's front pages, hot off the press. This is Patrick Christie's Tonight with me, Ben Leo, only on GB News. Evening. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office here on GB News. Tomorrow we'll see again plenty of April showers, some sunny spells and a chilly wind in the east. High pressure is slowly edging towards us and it will bring many of us a fine day on Saturday. But for the time being, we've still got low pressure and weather fronts in control. They've been bringing rain across the north through the day and that rain is now trickling southwards. So damp and drizzly for the Midlands, East Anglia and the southeast overnight. The southwest generally staying dry. With more cloud and more breeze, it is going to be a much, much milder night than last night. We started today with a frost in many areas. We'll start tomorrow at seven or eight degrees. A little colder in northern Scotland where there will be a really chilly wind blowing. That will be a feature of the weather right across these eastern areas tomorrow, a cold wind. Elsewhere where we'll start with a lot of clouds, a little bit of rain, but it should brighten up through the day. Certainly a much brighter day for Northern Ireland and especially Western Scotland compared to today. Still a few showers dotted around through the afternoon. And again, it is going to feel chilly, particularly in the east with that wind, nine or 10 Celsius. 14 or 15 further south. Temperatures will drop sharply on Friday evening, some pockets of frost to start the weekend, but for many it is going to be a fine day on Saturday. Decent amount of sunshine around. A bit more cloud and some patchy rain across northern Scotland. Still a bit breezy across East Anglia in particular, but for many, uh, as I said, a fine day on Saturday. Not spectacularly warm, highs of 10 to 14 degrees. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Ben Leo in for Patrick Christie. So I think by now it's probably Sonny himself somewhere down in the Canaries. Uh, lucky him. Time now to uh, bring you tomorrow's news tonight in the most entertaining paper review on telly. The very first uh, front pages have just been delivered for my press pack. OK, uh, I'm joined by Daily Telegraph columnist Alison Pearson, uh, Matthew Laza and Nana O'Queer. So the first story, Daily Mail, Sturgeon husband charged over SNP cash probe. Uh, Peter Murrell re-arrested today, more than a year after he was first questioned as part of a probe into the party's finances, and he has been charged tonight. Uh, the Metro, MP, <laughs> I need 5K to pay off bad people, don't we all? 
the Independent. <laughs> Your old life's obviously more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Gets crazy down south. Let me tell you. <laughs> Keir Starmer, police must probe MP over party cash for, quote, bad people. Uh, of course, Mark Menzies, the Tory MP, stripped of his role today as trade envoy, but Labour have accused the Tories of a worrying pattern of cover-up and inaction, as I alluded to in my... Um, uh, yeah, assessment of the situation at nine o'clock. The Daily Telegraph, uh, Telegraph, the PM vows to end sick note culture. So this is interesting. GPs will lose power to sign people off mm. uh, sick over fears worklessness is damaging the economy. What is it, something like nine million people? 9.4 uh, million. 9.4 million off work mm. for whatever reason. Sick, lazy. Uh, the Daily Express, uh, the PM tells sick note Britain, get a grip and a job. Very good. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's chat more about that Telegraph story, sick note culture. Uh, Alison, is this a good thing? GPs are going to lose the power to sign people off over fears that, you know, people out of work are damaging the economy, essentially. Well, it's uh, hugely damaging, Ben. You can't, can't imagine. A quarter of working-age Britons are off... Well, they're off work, but then about two and a half million are off sick. So this is a huge surge. And my own theory, I was very anti-lockdown for all the reasons that we're now seeing come to fruition. <laughs> and people got into the habit of, of not doing very much. Have we got used to it? We Absolutely. People got used to it. Let's not bother to go into work, save the money, commuting, etc., etc. So I think it's been a vicious spiral and some, some strong action is needed. And whether it's a Labour government coming in or whether it's the Conservative government in their dying days, somebody really needs to get a grip of this because, you, we, you know, we have huge national debt. We need people to be in work, basically. Uh, Matthew Laza, are they actually sick, these people? Well, obviously, um, quite a lot are, but I think... I think um, there's been a massive rise of mental health conditions, particularly post-COVID. Mm. So, look, if, if this works, you, if you're going to get people back into work, which is an absolute uh, goal, I think we'll all agree that, that is, you know, all economic success is about the percentage of people uh, of economically active age that you actually have economically active, um, there needs to be proper support behind this. So, it's one thing saying that GPs aren't going to be allowed to uh, s uh, sign off sick notes. That's OK if the health services uh, are put in place to support people back into work, because some people may need to go back part-time initially, but keeping keep people in touch with the way of work mm. is good for mental health overall. Do you remember that, that when the assessments were brought in under the under camera and there were a lot of horror stories of people who literally were in wheelchairs being forced out of them? Not because, because, the, it's because the assessment was run by a private company mm. badly. Like Pip. The, yeah, the, the, when Pip was brought yeah. in, absolutely. Some of the assessments, horror stories, were absolutely awful. This needs to be done properly, but it, I, I don't object to it. So, just, just some very quick stats. As you said, Alison, uh, around a quarter of Britons... Uh, of working age or economically inactive, that's 9.4 million. A record 2.8 million nana are inactive owing to long-term sickness up from 2.1 before COVID. For half of, more than half reported they had depression, uh, bad nerves or anxiety. Come on, are, yeah, well, am I being cruel here for telling no, you to no, man up? No, I think a lot of people you, you are doing this. can't say man up. But, but, but let's be fair. <laughs> well, let's be fair as well. I mean, look, the NHS is massive mega waiting list as well, so I wonder how many of those people who are off sick are actually on the waiting <laughs> list as well. Uh, and that's Again, total mismanagement of the NHS by the Conservative Party and the subsequent governments and the uh, before NHS. them as well. And the NHS... Mismanagement by uh, NHS management. Exactly. Management. I mean, the whole thing is just a complete mess, so I'm not even surprised by this. But because you can't prove this mental health thing, and it's not that there aren't people who aren't, you know, do suffer with it, but because you can't prove it, it's literally probably the easiest thing now. Years ago, you would never say, oh, it's my mental health. You'd actually literally not want anyone to know. Now, it's just everyone's saying it and there's no comeback. You can't question it. I think part of that was the catalyst with the Pierce Morgan thing, when you know the whole Meghan Markle Pierce Morgan, it became yeah. it became something now that if you said if you'd questioned someone's medical health, you could be in trouble. I mean, it, it just feels like you know everyone has bad days, everyone has bad periods, mm. you have peaks and troughs. You know, you get sad sometimes. Does that mean you are depressed? Well, I periodically had depression, and it can be terrible, yeah. but. Uh, a motive, something to go into work, mm. put in a day's work, mm. talk with colleagues, buy a cup of coffee, interaction, that's really important to mm. mental health. So yeah. sitting at home, you know, allowing stuff to kind of get on top of you in four walls can be very, very bad. Yeah. But the thing is, Ben, this is 
and we said before, it's, it's, it's a vast economic problem because people during lockdown were given money to stay home. People now think the government will pay for it. We are running out of money and we have to have tax revenue to pay for all the people who, who need health services. And, of course, it ties into the migration debate because you were talking earlier with Tim Adam about uh, legal migration. Mm. If you, you literally uh, aren't having people uh, in the existing workforce doing the jobs, you're bringing people in to do those jobs. And so that, that then sort of the, 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 yeah. the two are linked. Yeah. I think it's about giving people support back into work um, because obviously if you've got you know if you've got issue health issues means you can't work at all or you can only do certain work that's fine but on mental health it's like much more of a complex issue to just be basically put in a box and say you can't work and it's well, absolutely it's, people are yeah. victims. it's something that you don't really need any actual proof of though it's one of the it, before it was one of the most difficult things yeah. to say because you felt the stigma yeah. now that stigma is literally completely gone and actually I heard somebody on the radio talking they were just threw in oh yeah with my ADHD as if do you I mean, they just chucked it in there as if they wanted yeah. to, it was like they wanted to tell you about it. Okay. What, what, so I think just sorry, quickly, what Nana said is that a GP I know said many of the patients that she's seeing are a jeweler with cataracts, a teacher who can't, a bad mm. leg. It's these huge NHS waiting yes. lists yeah. are keeping people who want to work at home because yeah. they're ill and yeah. they can't get treated. Okay, well, the PM is going to give a, uh, a speech on welfare reform tomorrow on that, so uh, all eyes and ears mm. on that. But sticking with Rishi Sunak, the Rwanda chaos continues after the House of Lords blocked and delayed the bill again last night. And now, Prime Minister has quietly dropped his pledge to have flights off the ground by spring. <laughs> so the PM spokesman refused four times to say whether the target will still be met. Alison, these flights are never going to take off, are they? They're dragging their feet, Ben, aren't they? They don't seem... They yeah. said um, back in the autumn of last year that this was emergency legislation, which tends mm -hmm. to imply speed, doesn't it? But before Easter, they could have got it sorted then. Oh, let's leave it till two weeks after the Easter holidays. Well, I, don't, I don't know. Matthew's got a theory. They haven't got any yeah, planes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Matthew thinks they haven't got well, the planes. Didn't Grant Shapps today said that he'd use RAF planes? Well, I think there's some, uh, there's some, there's some question that. mark whether the RAF has got enough capacity to do this, partly because <laughs> I don't know if you saw the other week, <laughs> but it turns that the RAF is actually leases three of its planes to a holiday uh, flight company. No, 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 absolutely. No, 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 I'm not. No, no. Hilarious. Uh, so, uh, well, the, uh, uh, hang on a second. Yeah. The RAF planes ship off holiday makers for their jollies. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're basically, I mean, obviously, they're not, they're not fighter planes. They're, we're not they're, 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 the planes, country, they're the planes that they could be using. So, I mean, look, in, in defence of the Lords, the Lords has got a job to do, which is there's a revising chamber. It's not elected, and every single yeah, thing the Lords does, Ben, can be overturned. Well, exactly. So, the I... problem is, is the government, the, the Lords are passing their amendments and then they're all sitting there um, expecting them you know to be there till, until 3 a.m. in the morning because they go down the other side of the building to the commons and come that's why it's called ping pong because it used to literally be like that it's, it goes from one end of the building to the other backwards and forwards often in a day or two and instead the Tories are dragging their feet because they've got no planes it's, no no it's a comedy literally it's a complete comedy and it's a farce <laughs> because first of all they can ignore the ECHR and they can ignore the House of Lords I don't, want, I don't know why they just don't get on with it it said well, well we have to make this amendment and that amendment it is some sort of delaying tactic yeah. and I don't know what the main reason is but I suspect that they just literally have no they're scared they're scared to commit to it because they don't think it's going to work I think it's what it is is that the minute it's passed then the appeals will start coming in Ugh. so then it'll show that that actually it's not going to work do you know Ben that one day this coming weekend the number of uh, migrants who come across that will be the number that will ship to Rwanda in a year. I know, year. I know. In a year, I know. if it works. Same, okay. same with the Bibi. And if the house hasn't been yeah. sold off, yes. that they're going to go to in Rwanda. I, I, asked to, I said to Tim Lawson, and no-one's been able to give me a proper answer. I went to Australia in December. I followed Nigel Farage into the jungle. Mm. It was great fun. But I spoke to a lot of Aussies then, and they said, and we knew anyway from the mid-2000s, they had a small boat problem. They turned them back in the water safely, transferred them into very safe vessels back to either where they came from or to offshore processing sites. Tony Abbott stopped the boats overnight. He won re-election. Why doesn't Rishi Sunak, he's going to lose the election anyway, arguably, why doesn't he just come out and say, we're going to stop the boats in the water? No one's been out. Because to they've, tried to, they've tried to take the Aussie thing. It's all their political strategists and the Tories hiring are all Aussies. And they're all the people who got Tony Abbott re-elected. Yeah. But what they, what, what they don't realise is that you, it's harder to turn them back in the channel. Uh, 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 and and they, you, we can't, so we don't have an island. It'd have to be to Guernsey or Jersey. Yeah, but and that would go down I think the other problem is the civil service as well. I mean, let's not forget you've got a re resistant civil service who don't particularly want to help out and, and actually initiate and get 
get on with the government policy. So even yeah. if you do think you can do it, uh, border force or all of these people say, oh, we're not going to do that because we, 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 it's against our human rights okay. or something. All right, let me just show you this, this clip because it's, uh, <laughs> I was in stitches earlier when uh, the production team found this. They say bad luck comes in threes, and that's certainly true for these unlucky cyclists. I don't know if I'm out of order for laughing at that. I mean, that last one looks pretty serious. <laughs> are they okay? Yeah, <laughs> the first one gets up and walks. I'm not sure about the other. Are they okay? Do you know that they're okay? I don't know how they are. I mean, that last one looks in a pretty torrid state. You might state, not so. be alive after that. Well, look, best wishes to them. Maybe I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> no, but, uh, shouldn't uh, we move on. <laughs> oh, <sorry to>. oh. <laughs> uh, Prince William, he's returned to royal duties on the same day Prince Harry, his brother, officially abandons the UK. Should the Sussexes be with their family in their time of need? We debate this in tonight's Greatest Britain and Union Jackass. But first, Andrew Bridgen exposes the excess deaths that have been brushed under the political carpet. The public is being denied this data. This is unacceptable, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Yet again, data is hidden with impunity, just like the post office scandal. More of that after this short break. This is Patrick Christie's tonight with me, Ben Leo, only on GB News. Martin Dalby, weekdays from 3 p.m. Mark White was saying there, Sue, that he thinks it's getting worse. And again, you were nodding along to that. You've, you've seen this over decades. Situation is sprawling along the coast, more people, yes. and the danger is ramping up. Definitely, um, because the, the numbers and the money is... It's run like a military operation. Mm. I mean, I've been told that by the National Crime Agency, and I don't need to be told it by them to know it. It is meticulous because there's so much money involved. So they're, they're marshalling migrants here, the gangs, they're controlling the gangs, and there will be a Mr. A Kingpin. Mm. You know, in some city far away in Erbil, or even in Paris, or in Brussels, who never goes anywhere near the beaches. It's like a Ponzi scheme, really. Yeah. With that in mind, um, there's such vested interest, such money, such demand, a never-ending string of demand of people who yes. want to come here. How people are already on their way, remember? Yeah. If we stop them now, they're already leaving... There's people leaving the Sudan now are going to reach the only place they want to get to, the French beaches, to get to the UK. They'll arrive in two and a half years' time. And so, you see, they're on the way. If it's that organised, that lucrative, that desirable, how on earth do we ever break that chain? I th um, it sounds incredibly harsh, but I'm sure... I think if the EU uh, change uh, politically in the June elections, which I think it probably will, yes. I think they will put up, as the Greeks have done, holding camps all over Europe, the coasts of Europe, where people are reassessed, assessed just to see who is coming in, which would be a plus, mm. as the Greeks have done, because we have no idea who is coming in. Welcome back. Patrick Christie's tonight with me, Ben Leo, only on GB News. Let's get more of tomorrow's newspapers. Uh, let's kick start with the mirror. I warned the Tories about him three months ago. Uh, Tory chiefs were alerted to Mark Menzies, allegedly pleading for party cash to pay, quote, Bad people three months ago. Uh, OK, yep, good stuff. Let's... <laughs> Bad people. Uh, and the I says Brexit travel hope for UK students. So this is an interesting story. Uh, the EU is offering an olive branch to Labour, surprise, surprise, under 30s, set to benefit from EU plans to relax visa rules, which would allow them to live, work and study in European countries for up to four years. Years. Let's get the thoughts of my panel tonight. Daily Telegraph superstar Alison Pearson, former Labour advisor Matthew Laza, and GB News presenter Nana Aquir. Uh, Matthew, let's start with you. Yeah. Former Labour well, man. Keir Starmer makes no secret of the fact he wants to cosy back up to the EU, does he? Well, it's not just... It's not, this isn't really a case of cosying back up to the EU because it's giving British young people the future of which they thought they were, they were robbed of, which is that they, uh, you know, can't go uh, 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 and freely as they could to study, uh, to work uh, in the European Union. But I think one of the, it, the interesting things is if it's a two-way street, is it will help with that labour shortage that we were talking about. I mean, you know, the, you know the, the queues in your coffee shop because there's nobody to, uh, 
to make your flat white uh, or the queue in your supermarket because there's nobody to stack the shelves. And obviously, I mean, the, the, what the, it looks like is this will be modelled on a scheme that we have for people from Australia and New Zealand, which is quite, we all, we all know, you know, we, we might even have, you know, sort of uh, the, the Aussies that we know have come here pulling our pints, um, who've come on this youth mobility scheme, and a similar, there's a similar scheme for our people, mm. young people to go there. So it looks like it's modelled on that rather than reopening free movement as a whole. But I think for, I think it, the young people will think, at last, something for us. No, no, the, uh, the UK government, well, Downing Street, they've said tonight that uh, the government's in favour of reaching individual agreements with countries you know, on a solo basis, not a mass deal with the EU. Yeah, I think so. I, I would agree with that in an individual basis because this, to me, sounds like cheap labour, cheap labour, we're drunk on cheap labour again. Let's get the students to do it. And again, the EU, their, their motivation will be they've suddenly realised that they're losing money. They've lost the, the money of the British tourists going around to all the different EU, EU countries. It was, it, what was it called? Interrailing when, when I was Interrail, a student. Yeah. Yeah. still do that. You, 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 but, but, but it's not so open to them now because it feels like a closed shop because we're no longer part of the EU. So this is, this is uh, to me, another opportunity to start opening the door to cheap labour, and get the students to do it, and I think we'll find ourselves back in the same place we were. So, Addison, are you fearful of the future uh, and integrity of Brexit uh, if and when Labour well, get into government? Well, you know, I think that the, the loss of working and studying opportunities for young people... I was a very keen Brexiteer. For me, that was the biggest loss, probably. And I know a lot of younger generation, my kids are in their 20s, they felt it keenly. So I really, I would welcome this. I was talking to someone quite senior this week who said that they were at a number of quite high-powered meetings and they are absolutely, Ben, talking about making moves towards reversing Brexit. No, nothing we wouldn't exactly. have known, but that's, oh, you know... the beginning of it. I mean, it, that's it, the it, beginning it, of it. It is the, begi it is chip, the beginning chip, of chip it. Away. It is chip, chipping away. It is chipping away. Little things that we had that we didn't yeah. have that we don't. So I get it. I would rather have the individual choices. Because also, once it becomes a, a big conglomerate-type mass, it then becomes powerful. So then the EU can start dictating again to us how we should be operating and what the rules would be and everything else like that. But with the individual deals, then we still retain the power. I mean, so one I of the think... impacts that might hold it up is the discussion about whether when we were in the EU, EU students had to pay the, just pay the same fees as British students. Now, of course, they're in the lucrative international uh, mm. fees, which are tens of thousands more uh, than home students are charged. So, obviously, that impacts university funding as well. Do you know what? Brexit, right, under the Tories, hasn't been allowed to get started no. properly. It's been stopped and obstructed at every single... By obstacle. the Tories themselves? The Tories, the wets in the Tories. I mean, there's very it's few the real Conservatives in the well, Conservative though. Party. The Civil Service blocking at every route, uh, campaigners, the courts. And now, if and when Labour get in, it's going to be trashed, seemingly, based on what Alison says, completely, Alison. Well, these very mm. high-powered British people, this Ben, referring to us in high-powered meetings as a medium country... Mm no longer a great country, maybe we shouldn't even be in the G7. So as Liz Truss, who I interviewed uh, this week for her book, said in the Foreign Office, you get people who talk our country down. Mm. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 can, they can get stuff. And do you know what? The, uh, the EU hates us. Joe Biden they hates hate us. us. I tweeted this the other day. You know, uh, people in this own, our own country hate us, a big proportion of them. And actually, in actual fact, I think, uh, you know, if you care about the future of Britain, I think you'd probably want a Donald Trump election win later Absolutely. this year. Because he seems to be the only guy mm. who seems to actually, uh, you know, yeah, enjoy and appreciate sure. the UK. Well, also, Joe Biden, I don't even know whether he's awake or whether he knows where he is. Well, there were clearly issues around Joe Biden, but I fear a Trump presidency, but we'll disagree yeah. on that one. Okay. Right. Now, you usually don't hear a peep from the silent spectators in the House of Commons gallery, but today, MP Andrew Bridgen's speech on excess deaths caused a roar reminiscent to being inside Wembley Stadium. Watch this. Call on the government once again to immediately suspend the use of all mRNA treatments in both yeah, humans yeah. and animals pending the outcome of that inquiry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. No, 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 no. We would have to clear the gallery if clapping continues. I would order it if necessary.
Well, Alison Pearson, an empty chamber, almost empty, yet the gallery seemingly yeah. falls to the rafters, which, you know, it's a stark contrast. Disgracefully, so few MPs bothering to turn up for a debate mm. on an incredibly important issue. We have a large number of men of excess deaths, and specifically, we have a worrying number of excess deaths among younger people mm -hmm. now. And that sound from the gallery, that was the pent-up feeling of people who haven't been heard. And we had Andrew Bridgen addressing the excess deaths and the vaccine injuries, which we know are not mm. conspiracy yeah. theory now because they are in coroner's reports. So that was a disgraceful. MPs, they do not want to face up to the fact that what was described as safe and effective may well yep. pose now, problems. Now, now, really, very quickly, 20 seconds. Every day during COVID, we had a, a death toll on the mm. front of the papers, the, new, the broadcasters. Excess deaths now spiralling out of control. We don't have any of that. No one cares. Well, it seems everyone's forgotten about it, but I'm absolutely, I think it's disgraceful that those who've been injured by that vaccine have not been seen too properly. That needs to be addressed immediately. And thank goodness for Andrew Bridgen at least speaking out for those who Matthew, have been affected some negatively some balance Yeah, I mean, I think um, Andrew Bridgen is not uh, the most loved person in the House of Commons. That's hence why when he be. Uh, but I think sometimes the messenger kills the message, and clearly it's an issue that needs to be looked at. OK, yeah. AstraZeneca said in a statement, I've got to read this, patient safety is a highest priority and regulatory authorities have clear and stringent standards to ensure the safe use of all medicines, including vaccines. Our sympathy goes out to anyone who has lost loved ones or reported health problems. OK, time now for my favourite part of the show. Uh, let's crown tonight's greatest... Britain and Union Jackass. Alison, your greatest Britain tonight, please. The AstraZeneca vaccine no longer <laughs> exists, Ben. Andrew Bridgen is my greatest Britain. He's been uh, cheering on the House of Commons today for addressing that forbidden topic of excess deaths. And he's been a terrier, Andrew Bridgen, for all those people who feel they haven't been heard about their injuries. Good stuff. Worthy nomination, Matthew Laza. Mine is tenacious uh, campaigner and a Labour MP, former Labour deputy leader Harriet Harman, who's taken up a case uh, and won all party commitments to overturn a disgraceful situation where convicted paedophiles retain their parental rights over their own kids, even though they've been committed of the most extreme offences against mm. other no. children. Well, mine has got to be Prince William because he's returned back to work uh, after everything he's been through. It's his first official public appearance since his wife Kate uh, revealed she was diagnosed with cancer and he travelled to sorry to visit a charity. So, okay, I'm a him. parent. Uh, I love kids. Uh, I want to protect kids. So, Harriet Harman is tonight's greatest person. Well done, uh, Matthew. Uh, Alison. Your union jackass. It's Ruth Hunt, Baroness Hunt, former CEO of Stonewall, which I think has done so much damage mm. to children's lives by aggressively promoting trans ideology and puberty blockers in schools. And Baroness Hunt is now claiming all along that she was welcoming debate on this topic. No, she wasn't. Matthew Laza. So mine is Rishi Sunak, our Prime Minister, for taking over £38,000 worth of private jet flights from Tory donor uh, Akil Tripathi, despite the fact that he's had 14 million quid of his assets frozen by the High Court as he battles a civil fraud case. Mm. Nana? Uh, mine's got to be Conservative MP Mark Menzies, who suspended over allegations that he misused party funds. <laughs> Ooh, bad people. Bad people. <laughs> people after him. He denies it all, of course he does. Uh, bad people, Mark Menzies, denies all allegations uh, categorically. So, uh, yeah, anyway, tonight's Union Jackass is Baroness Ruth Hunt. Uh, she advocated puberty blockers for kids. Alison, as we all know, then said in uh, a paper at the weekend, I I was only listening to the experts, you know, I regret it. Well, that's OK. I mean, how many kids have been harmed in the process? I'm back tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Next up, it's headliners after your weather. Have a good one. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Evening. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office here on GB News. Tomorrow we'll see again plenty of April showers, some sunny spells and a chilly wind in the east. High pressure is slowly edging towards us and it will bring many of us a fine day on Saturday. But for the time being, we've still got low pressure and weather fronts in control. They've been bringing rain across the north through the day and that rain is now trickling southwards. So damp and drizzly for the Midlands, East Anglia and the southeast overnight. The southwest generally staying dry. With more cloud and more breeze, it is going to be a much, much milder night than last night. We 
we started today with a frost in many areas. We'll start tomorrow at 7 or 8 degrees. A little colder in northern Scotland where there will be a really chilly wind blowing. That will be a feature of the weather right across these eastern areas tomorrow, a cold wind. Elsewhere we'll start with a lot of clouds, a little bit of rain, but it should brighten up through the day. Certainly a much brighter day for Northern Ireland and especially Western Scotland compared to today. Still a few showers dotted around through the afternoon and again it is going to feel chilly, particularly in the east with that wind, 9 or 10 Celsius. 14 or 15 further south. Temperatures will drop sharply on Friday evening, some pockets of frost to start the weekend, but for many it is going to be a fine day on Saturday. Decent amount of sunshine around. A bit more cloud and some patchy rain across northern Scotland. Still a bit breezy across the East Anglia in particular, but for many, uh, as I said, a fine day on Saturday. Not spectacularly warm, highs of 10 to 14 degrees. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 